minute before we begin. Welcome to the webinar on financing climate resilience focused on DFIs in emerging markets. We have received an overwhelming response with 650 participants across India, Malaysia, Philippines, Japan, and other countries. Under the aegis of United Nations Climate Week New York, this webinar is a joint initiative by ADFIN, OCCSG, and ADFIAB. The aim is to equip DFIs in emerging markets with knowledge and skills to recognize the challenges and find opportunities associated with financing climate resilience. Association of DFIs in Asia Pacific, ADFIAB, is the focal point of 87 development banks and other financial institutions engaged in sustainable development financing in 36 countries and territories in Asia Pacific region. Okta CSG is a global expert advisory firm in climate finance, ESG climate risks, aimed at accelerating global sustainable finance and climate transition. A young organization standing at the intersection of finance, investments, and sustainability, and for its expertise, Okta CSG has been awarded marquee projects by international governments, multilaterals, and financial institutions in a short span of time. Advent's unique combination of development financial institutions and entrepreneurial development organizations allows ADFIM to promote synergy and collaboration towards unleashing entrepreneurship potential to serve the unserved and the underserved. With a membership base of 17 institutions consisting of DFIs and entrepreneurial development organizations, managing assets over 200 billion Malaysian ringgits, and ADFIM is an influential voice in the emerging markets. A few quick announcements before we start. We have an exciting lineup of speakers, and uh, therefore, I would like to request each speaker to observe the prescribed speaking time. For participants, please key in your questions in the Q&A box on the screen, and moderator would take it accordingly. In addition to Zoom, this event is also being live streamed on AdFIM's YouTube and Facebook page. First, we begin the webinar with standalone presentations and then follow it by panel discussions. We start with our first speaker, Mr. Mohammed Prasad Hanif, Secretary General of ADFIM. Mr. Hanif has over 16 years of professional success on national and international levels with strong concentration and enormous success in project management, business development, and human capital development. As a board member and the Secretary General of ADFIM, he guides the organization on innovative products and financial inclusion. Over to you, Mr. Hanif. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh and a very good afternoon to everyone today. Mr. Enrique Florencio, Secretary General of the Association of Development Financing Associations in the Asia Pacific region. Council members of the Association of Development Finance Institutions Malaysia, ADFIM, fellow eminent speakers and experts from Octus ESG, and respected guests and participants from around the world. Welcome to Malaysia. And welcome to this high-level webinar on financing climate resilience, a focus on DFIs in emerging markets. Let me first say how grateful I am to each and every one of you for joining us here today. This, this impressive turnout shows that sustainable finance is no longer a niche, it is going mainstream. Ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a wake-up call prompting governments, businesses, and investors to pay greater attention to environmental, social and governance ESG issues and stimulating all stakeholders to chart, a, to chart a sustainable recovery. The pandemic has revealed not only our vulnerability as a society, but also the critical importance of sustainable development. In the case of development finance institutions, it brings to light the importance of climate focused financing. Climate financing sets an opportunity for global players to refocus on the benefits of sustainability and responsible investment. While firms move through the recovery phase, they need to also look into the new reality. 
in which delivering sustainable finance will be an imperative. I think that this webinar is timely for us to realign our financing schemes to include the return, not only in financial terms, but also in the environment, social and governance terms as well. Therefore, since last year, ATFIM, along with various collaborative partners such as Octus ESG and ADFIAP, has been a strong proponent in sustainable development agenda organizing engagement sessions and forums with domestic and international partners. ADFIM has organized three international forums with experts from Qatar Development Bank, DFCC Bank of Sri Lanka, China Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, World Bank, IPDC Finance from Bangladesh, and, in, and many more around the world. As an association, we strive to continuously engage with various stakeholders to champion the sustainable development agenda both domestic and internationally, specifically sustainable financing. As such, we see amazing partnerships and collaborations being forged. Like today, we have Octus ESG and ADPIAP on the same stage with ADPIAP. Today, we continue to bring recognized speakers from around the world in various time zones to share their experience in this crucial subject matter, as well as sharing the trend that we hope to see for the future. We have speakers from Africa to India to the Philippines. Today's webinar is an important step in mobilizing the broad support needed to turn this strategy into practice. The various actors here today, DFA executives, businesses, civil society, regulators, supervisors, central banks, and others, all have a part to play. The webinar will give us ideas and experiences for us to set out the way forward. I hope that you will leave here inspired by the ideas you have heard and equipped with arguments to convince others back in your organization and countries. And I invite you all to act as ambassadors for climate financing. I also hope that the participants will engage with the speakers throughout today's webinar. We have provided Q&A opportunities for each session. With that note, I would like to conclude my speech again by encouraging the delegates to participate. I wish everyone a successful, safe, and fruitful webinar. Thank you. A very good evening. Thank and wassalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for the address, Mr. Hanif. Um, moving on, I would like to invite Mr. Enrique Florencio, Secretary General of ADFIAP. He has over 15 years of experience in ESG and works with ADFIAP members to promote integration of ESG standards to increase financing for environmentally sustainable, socially responsible, and climate-friendly projects. Over to you, Mr. Florencio. Thank you so much, Sanika. Distinguished attendees and speakers, Dear colleagues in the development community, ladies and gentlemen, a warm greetings from the Philippines. On behalf of the Association of Development Financing Institutions in Asia and the Pacific, the OCTOS ESG and the Association of Development Financing Institutions of Malaysia, I wish to thank and welcome you all for taking your time to join us today's webinar on financing climate resilience, focus on DFIs in emerging markets. At FIAP's Greening the DFI's initiative, which started from within the association about 23 years ago, is our commitment to sustainable development as we lead our members to undertake projects that are economically viable, environmentally friendly, socially responsible, and under the ambit of good governance. The twin objectives of the project are to institutionalize in its member DFI a set of environmental policies and practices approved by the Board of Directors and incorporated into its overall business philosophy. And an environmental monitoring unit to look after environment issues and concerns in its day-to-day -day operations. Our theme for today's event is just appropriate and close to our mission, given the growing importance of climate change and the impact it would have on emerging markets. Hence, an urgent need to drive effective action on climate resilience and climate change adaptation is very much crucial. We will be hearing from the different speakers today, best practice experiences and innovative solutions for DFIs to be equipped with the knowledge and skills to recognize the challenges and opportunities associated with financing climate resilience. To continuously provide long lasting solutions moving forward, we encourage our participants to be more innovative and responsive, to pursue clarity of purpose, 
optimize board and governance systems and structures, improve its internal culture and efficiency, enhance financial stability and influence, and accelerate progress and focus on sustainability. I look forward to meeting you all as we converse and renew our commitment to enable us to work together for a sustainable future. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for setting the context, uh, Mr. Florencio. That was succinct and insightful. Just a small note for everybody who's joined us, I would like to request everybody to put themselves on mute, uh, if not speaking. Moving on, we commence with our presentations for the webinar. Our next speaker is Mr. Ed Thompson, who would be speaking on the role of insurance in climate resilience. Ed is currently the Chief of Party for Sustainable Finance for Worldwide Fund for Nature uh, Philippines, WWF. He has over 20 years of conservation experience working on several projects of WWF in various capacities. Ed, you may go ahead and present uh, your presentation. Thank you, Sadekta. Uh, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, I have 10 minutes to share with you uh, the role of insurance in climate resilience financing. Uh, before I begin, I would like to introduce our work uh, in WWF. We have a sustainable finance team in the Philippines and in throughout the ASEAN region, where we work with the bank regulators and the banks themselves to uh, integrate ESG in their operations. So the, my objective with this uh, webinar is to introduce the role of insurance, its tools, because of their growing relevance in the light of growing attention to climate change and on the part of the banks, uh, their search for tools and uh, knowledge on how to measure and manage climate risks. And we are aware of the risks that confronts the region from in the Asia Pacific. We receive reports of events happening on a daily basis. And this is a quantification of the average annual loss of these events uh, in Asia Pacific. The metric used here is uh, the AAL, which is the same metric used in the insurance industry that measures risk in terms of uh, severity and probabilities. So it's a good way, it's a very compact metric that could be aggregated uh, across different assets and across uh, in a portfolio or across banks. So it's the same metric that is uh, gaining popularity among banks in measuring the climate risks. And there's a number of pilot activities ongoing now to make use of this metric in, in integrating this into the risk models of, of banks. Why is it important for DFIs? Well, first of all, DFIs are, are, don't, are, are, are mandated to finance a number of public infrastructure projects in our country. They are financing schools, hospitals, airport, power plants, and they are there to perform a public goods mandate. And what's unique with DFIs is they have the long-term exposure to these assets. Uh, in the case of some bank uh, development banks, up to 15 years of exposures. That means if your assets are, if you're holding on to an asset for 15 years, the risks uh, from climate change, the physical risks, are compounding, are larger than if you hold the asset for, let's say, two to three years. So it is important for DFIs to understand the whole spectrum of events, their probabilities and severities for that duration uh, in which they hold these assets. And right now, and, and more very recently, the IP, IPCC released their sixth assessment report, and it came with a banner headline, Code Red Humanity where in that report, it just shows that these events are happening faster and stronger. And in light of the pandemic, it's becoming more complex. It's a new world out there. 
So there are opportunities uh, in this for GFIs. And it's important to work with governments because of the context uh, in, in mitigating climate change and the insurance sector because of the tools that they have and also with the services that they offer to asset owners and to banks. So why insurance? Because risk is the reason for being. They've been managing, measuring risk for more than a hundred years. They've shown leadership and mod modeling. And from these models, they are able to price the risk from natural disasters to the insurance industry. Climate is not a distinct risk, but uh, a, a change in the frequency and intensity of events. So it's another way of, uh, of presenting risk within the same uh, tools that they already have. With uh, increasing intensities and frequencies, now that they are developing models to integrate physical and transition risks and into the climate scenarios. And because these insurance companies give one year coverage, they offer flexibility in adjusting their risks and their pricing uh, on a year to year basis. Right now, they are involved in uh, incorporating climate risk into their risk modeling, underwriting, and investment decisions. And these tools can complement and inform the actions of FIs, including the FIs, and of government as well. So for banks, there are untapped markets for climate-proofing assets, uh, including retrofits and in the design of new buildings. And there are opportunities for post-recovery financing, such as catastrophe bonds, which I'll show an example uh, in my last slide. In this uh, case study of San Salvador, here we show the model losses from flooding uh, by 2040, where the expected annual loss will be twice the 2015 level by 2040. And this is because of the growing uh, population, growing infrastructure, stock, assets, uh, that are near the hazard areas and, and with increasing frequency and severity of flooding, these risks are estimated to double uh, from their 2015 levels by 2040. And in, in the adaptation strategy that the country could take, they, measured, they could uh, reduce the risk by up to 25% in aggregated estimated losses uh, by 2040, and this amounts to about seven, 27 million US dollars. And this is where the financing is needed to, uh, to finance many of the adaptation strategies for flood risks. If these are implemented, uh, the premium coming from insurance coverage in, this, in these assets will be reduced by 35% uh, if uh, implemented successfully. Otherwise, if there are no adaptation uh, uh, activities uh, done, the premium would go high. It will be an affordable uh, to most of the asset owners and therefore many of these will go uninsured. So there's no protection for assets if we let uh, these uh, assets remain unprotected from, from climate risks. So, so this is the business uh, logic why uh, first adaptation financing is needed to reduce the risk and therefore the premium coming from uh, the risk reduction would follow as well. So here we find the components of a catastrophe model and it has uh, several elements which are, are combined, uh, coupled together. One is the hazard model, which is defined by stochastic events. These are mostly based in historical events, uh, which they catalog. And, and these are, are put into map forms uh, where you can find and locate an asset and identify the various hazards for this asset including the risks, uh, the level of uh, intensity, and the frequency of occurrence of these, asset, of these hazards. And this uh, frequency is measured in terms of return period. 
And here is where the banks are starting to uh, locate the assets uh, in their portfolio. And here they are able to calculate the damage that may arise coming from these hazards and compute for the expected loss that may happen in a given year. So it is from these four modules that combine together that allow insurance companies, the modelers, and some banks now to quantify the financial loss from climate risks. And it doesn't only give you a single scenario, but it gives you the whole spectrum of severities and frequencies that may occur for a given asset or group of assets in a given location. So this is the type of, type of tools that are finding its way into the banking sector for players to understand and identify their climate risks. Uh, we are working with the Central Bank of the Philippines to pilot the use of these tools with uh, about 20, 12 banks that represent half of the AUM of the banking sector to be able to map their, their, their loan, the mortgages, uh, the loan back assets, and later on to quantify this, uh, uh, the damages that they incur and inform their uh, capital adequacy requirements uh, later on. So these are exciting times for both banks and, uh, uh, and for the regulators in, in, in looking at these tools and methodologies. Uh, one of the important applications of the model is the use of vulnerab vulnerability curves. Well, the vulnerability curve is shown by this graph where in the, on one axis you find the damages coming from an event and on, on the x-axis shows you the severity of the event. So the, each of these curves represent a particular asset uh, uh, and, it's, and the slope of the asset depends on the kind of resiliency that uh, this asset uh, is able to perform no, against a particular hazard. Uh, this uh, curve is often used in CBA, in cost-benefit analysis of resiliency measures. And, and, and this can be modeled uh, across a whole range of event possibilities and severities. So the, these tools are not only used in, by the insurance industry in pricing, but these are also used for cost-benefit analysis for new designs uh, and also for the cost-benefit of, of a retrofit for a, for a building, for example. In the case of earthquakes, earthquakes is commonly used to assess the, uh, the, the uh, feasibility of, uh, of uh, earthquake retrofits. And these models, uh, these loss models, uh, they give you information as to where the asset lies in the spectrum, it's a whole risk spectrum. Uh, there are cert cer certain, uh, and, uh, certain uh, stages, certain segments of the risk spectrum which are funded or unfunded. The more common and low impact uh, events uh, impacting an asset are usually funded coming from our own reserves. Uh, and part of it also is funded from contingency funds that we set aside for, for those types of events. For, uh, for high impact, low frequency events, this is where the insurance market comes in and alongside uh, for extreme and, and, and very low frequency events, this is where catastrophe bonds come in. Uh, so here we find a case where in the Philippines, uh, the, the World Bank has issued the first catastrophe bond uh, for, for the Philippine government where uh, 225 billion has been raised in the uh, bond market to finance uh, uh, the event, if a catastrophe event happens in, in the country. 75 million is earmarked for uh, earthquake, 100 million is earmarked for tropical cyclone and excess rainfall. Uh, what happens is that the World Bank um, issues a bond to investors uh, where they uh, peg the interest rate above the fixed market rate. So there's an attraction for these investors to invest uh, above market rates. Uh, 
And these are held for about three years, uh, very short term. So the exposure is not so large for these investors. So the, the, uh, when, when an event happens, the proceeds from the bond will be used to pay for, for the recovery of the, of the country from that event. And, and the money goes to financing uh, damage coming from earthquakes or, for, or from uh, typhoons. So this is an example. This is an exciting uh, instrument. It came out just before the pandemic uh, uh, last year, uh, in early part of 2020. And it shows that there's an appetite from, uh, from global investors to fund uh, catastrophe bonds uh, in third world settings. So there are, because of this, it shows that there is uh, a business case or there is a business, there's a, Yes, there's a business case for these types of instruments to grow in the region and to create new products that may be derivatives uh, from these types of instruments. So you're not you're 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 not limited by by it's just the, you know, your imagination is just your limitation as to the possible uh, number of products that can uh, be created from from these successful issue, issuance. So I guess uh, with that, I'll stop my presentation. I hope you were able to uh, uh, make use of, uh, appreciate the role of uh, insurance and the tools that they use for measuring risks. Uh, with that, I end my presentation. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ed. That was very insightful. Uh, to complement this presentation, we have with us Mr. Olympus Manthata, Head of Climate Finance at Development Bank of Southern Africa. Mr. Manthata has been instrumental in assisting DBSA to obtain Global Environment Facility Accreditation. Uh, Mr. Manthata will share a case study of DBSA. Good morning. I hope uh, you can hear me. Um, and good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever that is relevant. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this important uh, meeting. Um, yeah, I look forward to share with you a case study from the DBSA. Uh, Maybe just as a form of a, a introduction, the, the, the DBSA, um, uh, based in South Africa, operates mainly within um, Southern Africa, but actually has a continental mandate uh, within the continent of Africa. The space we operate in mainly is financing uh, infrastructure uh, development. I come from the Climate and Environment uh, Finance uh, Unit, and our role really is to mobilize uh, climate financing from various uh, financing mechanisms, such as the GEF and the GCF, and the view is really to uh, blend these resources with uh, our own uh, balance sheet resources to support mitigation and adaptation uh, projects. So the, the facility that I would want to share with you about today is a facility that we have put together flowing from our accreditation with the, with the GCF. And we, we call it a climate financing facility. Um, and the, the intention with this fund really was the recognition that uh, you know, public resources alone are not going to be sufficient really to move the needle. Therefore, they need to be used in a, you know, um, innovative way uh, with the view of crowding in as much private capital as possible into support for the climate agenda. So the climate financing facility is a structured finance platform um, uh, which is co-funded on a 50-50 basis by the DBSA and the Green Climate Fund. And uh, it aims to support, as I've mentioned, mitigation and adaptation uh, projects. Um, 
the way this facility really works is to catalyze private sector funding, as I've mentioned. And, you know, we have got um, an aspirational ratio that we seek to achieve of one is to five in terms of the leveraging effect. Um, it operates uh, in, in four countries in Southern Africa, South Africa, Eswatini, Lesotho, and Namibia. And the choice of the countries was really uh, informed by, you know, them being uh, on a common monetary uh, basis. Therefore, you know, reducing the complexity of dealing with hedging uh, issues, considering that we receive the funds from the GCF in dollars and implement in local currency. Some of the key uh, products that we are offering through the climate financing facility comes from our consultation and engagements, especially with commercial banks in trying to understand what are the key barriers to them participating in supporting mitigation and adaptation projects. And there were really two key things that came up. The, the first was really around the need for, you know, you know, first loss facility to help in uh, mitigating uh, the risk. But I think the bigger part was really tenure extension. As you would know, many commercial banks, because of your, you know, Basel three regulations, you know, the, the, there's limitation in terms of the, 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 the tenures uh, they can, uh, you know, be able to support. And therefore, the, the CFF was meant to provide both um, um, first loss or subordinated funding as a credit enhancement and or a, a tenor extension to allow the participation of, uh, you know, commercial and largely uh, private uh, finance. So we, we, we pretty much take a blended finance approach uh, using the concessionality that we receive from, you know, the GCF uh, and, uh, you know, ensuring that we offer a competitively priced product. But what is even more important to mention is that, you know, the fullness of the concessionality that we receive from the GCF is passed on to sub projects. So we do, we do not seek to enhance our own returns based on this uh, concessionality. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, uh, please. Um, the next slide just gives a, you know, just a, an overview of how the, the facility is structured. Um, you know, as I've mentioned, it's co-funded between the, the, the GCF and the DBSA. So, you know, we, we, we got approval from the GCF of uh, 55 million, which we meshed. And the idea also is to say, you know, we start this at a lower base with the view that we can then replicate and expand when we have learned enough on the ground. Um, and uh, the facility is uh, housed uh, within the, the, the DBSA. It was really based on the uh, Green Bank model, but the idea that we had was that it is ideal to house it under the DBSA so that you can benefit from, you know, your back office uh, uh, capacity. Um, and, uh, you know, so your, your activities like your uh, deal origination uh, is also supported from, you know, within, uh, uh, you know, the, the bank. And uh, there's a dedicated team uh, that, uh, that would manage uh, the fund. And, and of course, with this, the idea is then to, you know, then crowd in private investment to support sub projects. And one of the things that informed this was that our experiences with uh, the GCF was that, you know, because of the lengthy periods it could take to get approval, it makes a lot more sense to be going to the GCF for funding facilities large facilities or programs as opposed to single projects because it then makes it easier when you are controlling the funds from a DBSA level uh, that you can be able to be responsive to, to clients, but also it makes it easier to um, uh, co-fund with other you know, financing resources in the sense that you can easily synchronize 
your appraisal uh, processes. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. So the, the facility supports both uh, mitigation and adaptation. On the mitigation side, we, we're really looking at um, you know, renewable energy projects, energy efficiency in industry and in buildings. Then we look at sustainable and low emission transport. And then we also look at uh, the, the waste space, especially waste to, to energy. And then the, on the adaptation side, we are in the main looking at water supply management, especially you know the the the, the water efficiency and treatment uh, uh, projects, and generally your climate resilient water infrastructure uh, facilities. So that is really um, you know in the main uh, the, the sectors that the, the the facility would look at. Can move on to the next. With regard to you know how we approach uh, uh, origination, you know we look at uh, various uh, uh, sources. You know internally within the, the the bank, we'd look at our you know coverage team, our business development team, um, you know to to you know to to assist in identifying appropriate projects to to support. We also have within the the bank uh, project preparation. Um, you know, capability. So projects that are prepared through that facility could also potentially benefit from this facility. Um, you know, we also from time to time run, um, you know, requests for proposals, uh, which also bring in uh, opportunities for us to, to look at. But it could also just be referrals from various uh, development fin finance institutions. But in the main, uh, you know, it's more how we cooperate with commercial banks for the pipeline of projects that they've not been able to support without their, their assistance of uh, the CFO or a similar uh, facility. So that is really in the main, uh, the, the, the various uh, sources of deal flow that um, we look at. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. So, I think the, the next slide that I just wanted to talk to really is just a very short overview of um, you know, a, a project that we have um, or we are currently assessing for support through the climate finance uh, facility. And talking to this is important to understand that this facility has a mandate that is slightly you know, different from that of the of, of the bank itself, both in terms of uh, sectors, but also in terms of, of size. So we'll see when you go to the next slide, even in terms of the, the, the size of um, uh, the project that we are able to, to support through this facility. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. So I was just talking mainly to you know the, the size of uh, please go back. Yeah, I was just talking to the size of the projects. You'll see there we're talking about total project cost for this uh, project of 132 million, where you know the envisaged contribution of the CFF would be 45 million. This is this would be a relatively a small size project compared to your typical, uh, you know, project that would fund from the main, um, you know, facilities that the bank has in place. But this then allows us to to really be able to, you know, uh, support projects that would otherwise not have been uh, supported through our main financing instruments. And the, 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 the type of structures that we look at here typically would be to say, you know, you would look at at least providing 30% contribution from the CFF in the form of a subordinated uh, facility with the view that the, you know, the project sponsors can bring along at least a equity contribution of uh, 
let's say 20%. And the idea is that you, you are then best positioned to be able to attract, you know, a senior debt from it be commercial banks or other private funders. So in this particular project, it's really a project that's got to do with hydroponics uh, farming in Namibia. And, um, you know, the, the, the key attractions here was really the potential of enhancing, you know, energy efficiency and water efficiency uh, uh, systems. So um, the, the, the project uh, is operated in, um, in Namibia, as I've mentioned, and it's been in operation since 2001. And, uh, you know, really in primary a production of, um, you know, cucumbers and, and peppers operates about uh, three and a half hectares uh, greenhouse, uh, which is currently being expanded. And, um, you know, the requirement and the ask, as I mentioned, sitting at uh, 132 million. And, uh, you know, with our contribution, we are now able to unlock, you know, private investment from other sources to, to support, uh, you know, the, the, this project. And as I've mentioned, we're just finalizing due diligence processes with the, with the view of uh, uh, financially uh, closing the project. And the, the impact that we are really looking at achieving is, uh, you know, uh, uh, energy, water efficiency, as, I, as I've mentioned, recycling up to, you know, 80%, you know, looking at uh, about 400 kilowatt solar power system to be installed. And uh, with this, uh, we look at achieving 511 metric tons of CO2 emissions. So if you look at this project, it will it, it look more like on the small side, but you know, when we look at replication and expansion of these facilities, then we can really start to see impact on the ground especially in support of, uh, you know, countries in our region as they seek to advance their uh, nationally determined contribution through various initiatives that they are looking at. So we really see this facility as, a, you know, an important instrument, especially from uh, crowding in of, uh, you know, other sources into the mitig mitigation and adaptation space. And as I've mentioned, we, we're looking at uh, successful implementation followed by expansion and replication. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Mandarra, for presenting. Uh, that was really, really interesting. Next in line is Mr. Manish Chaurasia, Managing Director of Tata Clean Tech. Mr. Chaurasia is a financial services professional with over 25 years of experience in origination, credit risk assessment, and syndication in, a, in the Asia-Pacific region. Under his leadership, the company starting from scratch has funded over 250 projects in clean tech sector, saving nine tons of carbon dioxide annually, and has executed a number of marquee advisory assignments and tied up with a number of global climate, inve climate finance investors to channelize low-cost funds to the clean tech sector in India. Over to you, Mr. Chaurasia. Uh, thank you. And I want to thank the uh, organizers, ADFIM, ADFIAB, Actor CSG, for this wonderful opportunity. I've got, a, I've got about 10, 15 minutes, and I've got about 10, 12 slides to present. So I'll quickly upload my presentation. Just give me one second. I hope the presentation is visible on the screen. Yes, yes it is. Okay, so uh, in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes, I will talk about the journey of Tata Clean Tech Capital uh, and uh, the kind of products we deal in and also the kind of risk systems we have got. So in India, we have got non-banking finance companies which deals with the various sector-specific funding. It can be housing, it can be gold, it can be consumer durables. We are a specialized non-banking finance company, 
which deals with only climate finance. Uh, the unique thing about us is that uh, most of the initiatives which we see in uh, climate finance through green investment banks, they are all with public funds. Uh, we are unique because uh, we are the first private sector green investment bank in emerging economies. And as I told you, our focus is climate finance and also advisory services. Uh, we deal in project finance uh, by way of senior debt and also the advisory services. Uh, since our inception and uh, in about uh, 2015, as I told you, we have funded over 250 projects and we have funded a capacity which aggregates about 10.8 gigawatts of renewable projects. And in the process, actually, we have averted uh, much more uh, CO2 than was told earlier. It is about 16.1 million tons. Uh, we are an institution jointly promoted by Tata Group of India and also IFC uh, Washington. Uh, we fund uh, various sectors, uh, including utility scale, solar, wind, distributed solar, uh, power transmission, water treatment, uh, small hydro, biomass, energy efficiency, electric mobility. Uh, so uh, since uh, we started scaling our business in 2015, we have grown at a CAGR of around 40%, and our current portfolio is about 912 uh, uh, million US dollars. And uh, we have funded over 250 projects. Uh, I'm happy to say that in 2019, uh, during the Climate Week in New York, uh, we were uh, inducted into the uh, Global Green Banking Network. Uh, if you see the number of uh, global green uh, banks which are there in this network, uh, there are about uh, nine uh, such banks. The unique thing is that all these banks are from the private, from the public funds, and we are the only one which are from the private funds. Uh, normally, the thought process is that if you are dealing in climate finance, uh, then probably you know the business will require providing a lot of subsidies because the role is developmental. But I'm happy to say that the way we have conducted our business, that we have not only played the developmental role, but at the same time, we have been fairly profitable. Uh, since our inception, our net worth has grown by about 27% per annum. We have operated at a very comfortable leverage of four and a half. Our portfolio has grown by a CAGR of 40%. We have maintained a fairly a decent dims of four and a half percent. Our profitability has grown by 41%. And our return on equity has been close to 3%. And driven by our leverage and return on equity, our uh, 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 return on assets, our return on equity has been upwards of 15% last year. Over the last uh, six, seven years, uh, we have uh, disbursed a total debt of over 2 billion US dollars. And our current portfolio is about uh, a billion US dollars. Uh, the unique thing we have done is that because uh, we have gone into this segment ahead of its time, we have been able to crowd in a lot of other banks. So we feel that we have given a unique model to the world where not just uh, public sector institutions can fund uh, climate finance, but also private sector institution can do it and do it profitably. Uh, in our journey, uh, we have believed that uh, collaboration is extremely important because we are dealing with unique products. So we have entered into a number of uh, partnerships. We have strategic partnership with the Green Climate Fund. We also have a partnership with IFC, who is, of course, our equity investor. We have also partnered with the public sector green investment bank in India, which is IRIDA. We have also partnered with the government department called Bureau of Energy Efficiency, and which each of them we have developed specific products. Apart from this, we have uh, painstakingly raised a lot of uh, money from climate investors. Uh, we have raised money from AIIB, from JICA, from FMO, uh, and from a lot of other uh, banks who are into green loans. Now, the benefit of this partnership is that uh, we are able to provide the kind of funding which is required by the clean tech sector, which I'll explain in some detail. Uh, apart from this, uh, we have dealt with number of clients, which are both the Indian clients, the multinational companies. We have not only funded their projects, we have also syndicated their uh, debt with other uh, institutions. And then we have provided advisory services to a number of institutions, including World Bank Group, IFC, GIZ, some corporate groups like Alphanar. Now, uh, these partnerships have played a very important role in, uh, in providing the unique financial products which is required by the clean tech sector. Uh, in the kind of funding we are doing, the unique thing is that uh, most of the projects have got very high capital cost. You take wind, you take solar, or you take hybrid of wind and solar, or if you take battery storage. All of this have got very high capital cost, but their operating costs are very, very low. But because the capital costs are so high, 
the returns come only over the period of 25 years. So they require very long-term loans. The key challenge in the Indian market is that while banks are flush with liquidity, but they are not able to provide long-term loans, which are fixed rate. So to take care of this, we have a developed strategic partnership, like I talk about Green Climate Fund. With Green Climate Fund, we have raised a 20 years line, uh, which is at a fairly uh, uh, concessional rate. And because of this, we have been able to develop the solar rooftop market in the country. So this is one type of collaboration we have done, where we have ensured that the projects which, which have high capital cost and which are going to give returns over a longer period of time, we have tied up long-term loans, and that's how we have funded these sectors. Apart from this, uh, uh, in this clean tech sector, we also have uh, a few projects, like say, uh, retail uh, segment uh, mobility financing, uh, electric mobility financing. Now, these projects also at a retail level have high capital cost. Uh, the capital cost of uh, uh, electric vehicle is much higher than the capital cost of ICE vehicle. At the same time, there are some uh, doubts on the technology because the technology is new. Although they are established technology, but the consumer still has some doubts. So what we have done is that uh, we have collaborated with the developers, we have collaborated with multilateral institutions, and we have come out with the product of first loss guarantee. Uh, uh, both uh, through the multilateral institution and also through the developer. And that is how we have been able to provide uh, low cost funding to the sectors like uh, mobility and also to the sectors like solar rooftop. So these are some examples of the, of the kind of financial products we have developed. Uh, mainly they revolve around either giving a first loss guarantee or providing uh, long term loans, which are not available through the commercial uh, financing institutions. Sorry. Uh, now, we feel that our model is highly uh, scalable uh, because uh, we are an India-focused uh, institution and in India has a very ambitious target of uh, developing renewable energy. Today, India is sitting on 100 million capacity of renewable energy, but the target is to go up to 450 uh, gigawatts in the next eight to nine years. So today, while the country is implementing about 10 gigawatts uh, per uh, annum, the target is to go up to 25 to 30 gigawatts per annum. So this will require huge investments. Apart from this, uh, there are other sectors which are emerging sectors like electric mobility I talked about, like energy efficiency, especially LED lighting and the electric motors. Uh, then the water sector in adaptation and also some other sectors like uh, city gas distribution, wastewater treatment and so on and so forth. Uh, all these sectors will require huge investments by 2030. Our estimate is the investment required is about 2 trillion uh, US dollars. And this has to be seen in the context of the fact that uh, the total size of the banking sector itself in India is about two and a half million uh, US dollars. So in the next eight years, we are talking about uh, almost uh, you know two trillion going to into just one segment, when the banking sector itself is about two and a half trillion. So huge funding is required, and we do feel that with the kind of financial innovation we have done, we have got a head start and a competitive advantage. Uh, now. Uh, uh, to maintain this competitive advantage, we have significantly worked, uh, worked on our uh, risk systems, which I'll talk about. But before that, I just want to highlight that uh, I talked about our collaboration with Green Climate Fund, uh, through which we have got 100 million line for the solar rooftop segment. And through that line, uh, we have a significant share of the solar rooftop market in the country, which is about 24%. And uh, till date, we have funded more than 500 solar rooftop installations. Apart from that, we have done projects in a number of other sectors like street lights, uh, like smart meters, electric buses, as is mentioned in this slide, uh, sewage water treatment, water desalination, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, uh, to uh, to maintain this competitive advantage, uh, I think uh, you know, and to and and of uh, maintaining the growth in the sector, the key advantage we have got is our unique systems, our risk systems, which I'll talk about, uh, uh, which I'll talk about next. So first is that uh, we have got uh, the sector expertise, uh, you know, not only in financial services, but we have also recruited a number of people who are experts uh, in technical part uh, of the business. And we also have experts who have domain knowledge and who are expert in the advisory business. So that is our one advantage. The second advantage is that we have built a very strong uh, due diligence uh, framework uh, where we have collected a lot of data over the last few years. Uh, we have built our uh, IT systems. And uh, we have built the systems to ensure that projects we are doing are viable. Apart from this, we have got a very strong social and environmental management systems. 
so we not only see projects uh, from the angle of uh, the basic viability of the project from the technical angle, but we also see it from the social angle and also from the environment angle. So, uh, so for example, if we are doing a solar project, then uh, one of the things which we consider is that uh, how is the water coming to that project? If we find that uh, there is no sources of water nearby and the uh, and the groundwater is being used, then we do our analysis on what is the uh, what is the water table in that area, and whether that area will be able to uh, have the source of water for cleaning the panels. If we find that the water is not sufficient, then we insist on some technology being used to clean the panels. So that is what uh, this is one example of what we do on the environmental side, and also in the wind side we do a lot of due diligence uh, on uh, you know the way it is going to impact uh, the environment, uh, the migratory birds and all. To give you just one example, in India recently we had a uh, issue of uh, one bird which is getting instinct called uh, Great Indian Bustard. So a uh, lot of projects came up in Gujarat and Rajasthan uh, uh, in in area where this uh, this particular uh, birds are. Uh, uh, where these birds migrate and they are actually going uh, extinct. So after our study, we realized that uh, this is a social issue in the project and the environmental issue. And we decided not to fund those projects. And after that, uh, the Supreme Court in the country did came out with the guideline of those projects uh, transmission network going underground because of the fact that it is operating the birds which are getting uh, extinct. So this is the kind of due diligence we do on the social and environmental side. Uh, Apart from this, uh, we also have a very strong comprehensive monitoring network uh, framework. The advantage of this is that uh, we are dealing in a segment where viability is still getting established, although there are some sectors like solar and wind where it is established. But still, there are new projects in the, in the, uh, in the energy storage sector, in the energy efficiency sector, where the viability is not exactly established. So we do a very strong monitoring of the projects once the loans are disbursed. And through that monitoring, we come to know a lot about the projects, about uh, what went wrong vis-a-vis -vis our original estimation. And based on that, we advise the credit team to change their appraisal standards. And based on this, we also get in touch with the developers. And we kind of advise them as to what they need to do better. So these are some of the things which we have done uh, specifically because we are in climate finance and which has helped us to fund so many projects. I would like to add that while we have funded more than 250 projects, in our portfolio, we have only one non-performing asset. And there also, it is non-performing mainly because the off-taker was weak. And uh, there was a legal issue which is getting sorted out. Apart from this, we have built a very strong IT systems about which I spoke about. So at various parts of our due diligence, we generate a lot of data, uh, both during the due diligence and during our, our monitoring. We capture all this data in our data lake. And then we massage this data and try to understand the sector better. We also share this information with the developers so that the entire ecosystem learns from this. Uh, apart from this, we have got a dedicated research team. So we are not only focusing on the sectors which have already achieved scale, but we are also trying to understand you know, how competition can intensify in that sector and how things can go wrong. And accordingly, we advise the government. Apart from this, we are doing research in new upcoming sectors like green hydrogen and the battery storage, uh, which helps us to understand how these sectors can be scaled up and what are the policy level changes which are required. And accordingly, we advise uh, the governments. So this is briefly about us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, with this, uh, the presentations were brilliant. We now very quickly dive into a very interesting and an interactive panel discussion a climate side chat. This discussion is going to be moderated by Namita Vikas. Namita brings with her over 30 years of diverse global experience in climate change strategy and sustainability across sectors, including banking and technology. Namita has been instrumental in driving robust climate finance strategies and ESG frameworks. Currently, she is the founder and managing director of Optus ESG and the global board member of Climate Bonds Initiative. Yeah. I'm inviting Namita to deliver her special address yeah. and moderate the climate side chat. Namita, the virtual stage is yours now. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Sanika, and a big thank you to all the speakers, Ed, Olympus, Manish. We've all been a part of this journey and uh, your insights were truly valuable. I'm sure this has been a big learning for everybody who's present here. So ahead of us, we have a very interesting climate side chat, bringing in DFIs to discuss 
climate resilience financing, particularly with a focus on emerging markets. The expert panel is here with us, and I would like to extend a very warm welcome to them. I will introduce them a little later. Uh, well, you know, we've seen and heard examples. DFIs undoubtedly offer a unique opportunity for scaling climate resilience financing. While they operate in a way that is somewhat similar to commercial banks, their mandate to focus on sustainable development objectives is what sets them apart. Uh, their risk return appetite is certainly a differentiator. We heard it from the previous speakers as uh, DFIs are more willing to take greater risks and carry along uh, a long-term kind of a horizon perspective on the returns. On the other hand, the risk return appetite eases pressures linked to economic performance and profitability, but more importantly, I think it places them very uniquely to finance climate-related projects. Uh, from this really stems the immense potential in harnessing patient capital to support climate resilience in emerging markets. So, uh, for example, in, a, in uh, the financial year 2020, the Association of Development, European Development Financial Institutions, whose members have a combined AUM of 50 billion USD in emerging markets and frontier markets, um, announced that it would align all its new financing decisions by 2022 to the Paris Agreement objectives and ensure achieving net zero emissions targets by 2050. So emerging markets are also evolving. They've been affected by the pandemic badly. To make things worse, the developed markets commitment to raise the $100 billion for climate finance is yet to be met. And these markets do need the support from development and international finance institutions to accelerate this whole climate journey as well as meet the developmental objectives. Now, whether in form of policy, advocacy, technical assistance, or international capital flows, or technology transfers for that matter, all this is much desired and much required. So, you know, if you look at emerging markets, and we heard some of the panelists talk about, you know, how the risk mitigation is being done or how they are uh, collaborating with other partners, I think the barriers that exist are several in building climate resilience, including limited fiscal space that hinders adaptive ability, worsening climate shocks, raising cli risk premiums, and increasing the cost of borrowings, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, that we see uh, from, a from a global financial ma market perspective. So when debt costs are higher, adaptation measures are even less feasible. So reducing climate vulnerability in emerging markets is therefore becoming extremely critical. And investing in resilience can put a lid on the climate risk premiums, as we have seen in some of the other presentations. So it is a challenging task, and therefore, um, uh, you know, this needs to be looked at. So climate finance at the moment is mitigation itself is a challenging task when you go beyond renewable energy. So how do you look at other sectors and then looking at resilience that that makes it uh, that makes it even more um, uh, challenging as we go. So justifying high upfront costs for benefits only to be seen in the long term in the face of immediate financials or non-financial shocks is also becoming uh, increasingly difficult. So for example, uh, emergency responses to the pandemic and mitigation um, towards socioeconomic fallout from the COVID crisis led to a fall in multilateral development banks or DFI's investments, uh, particularly uh, pertaining to climate finance in 2020. The pandemic drew the curtain back on the global vulnerability uh, not only uh, to uh, focus on shocks to healthcare systems, but also social protection, businesses, investments, and non-financial uh, risks. Uh, so we really need to look at transformative capital from BFIs that is needed to build resilience to um, similar unprecedented shocks, which could occur at any time um, that we saw during the, the pandemic. Uh, well, while we've, talking, we've spoken about the risks and we've highlighted uh, risk mit mitigation methodologies, I think it's also important to focus on the opportunities and the sheer market size of climate finance and the potential that it is offering, both from a business case or a profit standpoint, or building greater resilience to shock. So uh, I, IMF says that every $1 invested in adaptation could yield up to $10 in net economic benefits. DFIs have demonstrated the catalytic role that they have played within climate finance and economic growth. 
Uh, some have challenged the unbankability of small sized projects, high capital requirements or higher risks due to uh, the, compa the uh, comparatively fewer financial returns. We've seen how concessional debt and guarantees and form of interest subsidies, waivers on down payments, longer repayment periods have, uh, that, that have been offered by DFIs are helping uh, making ca the capital more accessible and affordable uh, to borrowers. And then de-risking instruments like credit enhancements or blended finance or pool structures have uh, closed the investment gap. So it's very important to now get into understanding the role that some of the DFIs have played on climate financing, scaling up models, and the impact that has been created. We have some very, very senior practitioners with us here today, and they are industry leaders with abundant experience in um, finance and climate action. Uh, so um, I would uh, you know, like to introduce uh, the panelists first and then get into asking them questions. So from the International Finance Corporation, we have Shalab Tandon, who is the regional head of operations and uh, South Asia head of climate business. Uh, well, Shalab and I go many years and he has over two decades of experience at uh, the institution as an investment and development banking professional covering a range of industries from renewable to infrastructure to evolving sectors like e-mobility and fintech. And IFC2 has a huge footprint in India and as of 2021 has mobilized over $3.7 billion for climate action in the country. Uh, the next uh, panelist is uh, Ahmed Pada, uh, Director of the International Renewable Energy Agency, ERINA. Uh, he has over 30 years of international experience in banking and finance. Um, he spearheads IRENA's uh, climate investment platform that is aimed at multi-stakeholder partnerships for scaling climate action and mobilizing investments. Uh, prior to IRENA, Ahmed held leadership positions with the World Bank and EBRD. So welcome to you and welcome to Shalab. Uh, Rossico De Cruz is currently uh, the next, uh, sorry, the next panelist who is the vice president and head of uh, program development and management uh, with the Development Bank of the Philippines. He comes with over 27 years of experience in banking, development, renewable energy. More importantly, his experience is within MSMEs, SMEs, water and sanitation. And the uh, DBP funds several climate initiatives, including the agroforestry plantation program or the green financing program. So welcome, Rastiko. And Jigar Shah, who is with us, is the CEO and the head of research at Maybank Keming Securities India. Uh, Jigar comes with, again, over 25 years of experience in Indian capital markets, equity research, sales, and portfolio management. Uh, Jigar's views on equity markets, economy, sectors, and stocks are regularly covered by Indian and international media, including Bloomberg. Uh, Jigar has been a part of the sustainable finance journey at Maybank Global and has contributed to mainstreaming it within the institution. So I'm very excited uh, to hear from these panelists on financing climate resilience. Uh, I am sure the next um, you know, 50 minutes uh, are going to be very fascinating. So my first question is to you, Shalab. IFC has made huge strides in climate finance over the past many years, especially in emerging markets. What has been the institution's thinking and strategy towards 2030 agenda? Thanks, uh, thanks, Namita, for your kind words and for your invitation. It's, it's glad to be here among so many participants and fellow panelists. At a high level, uh, you know, just to give a background, uh, IFC has invested over $30 billion in climate finance globally, and you rightly said $4 billion in India. And we have mobilized over $25 billion of private capital in climate finance. And on its own balance sheet, we've issued uh, more than $10 billion of green bond. So we have a lot of experience financing climate. We were amongst the earliest investors in renewable energy in India in 2008 when we financed the first solar plant and, and went on to become a large company in the Azure, uh, which was later listed on the stock exchange and so on. But today, the, I think the time has come move beyond just renewable. Renewable financing has pretty much, at least in India, become quite commoditized. There are a lot of banks looking at it and so on. So the IFC and the DFI role is now shifting towards mainstreaming climate finance in a number of sectors which go way beyond financing renewable energy. 
And that's really our uh, challenge, our goal, and our strategy. Towards that, and, and in line with the 2030 objectives, our World Bank uh, Group President has recently announced our Climate Change Action Plan 2021 to 25, which sets out ambitious goals for the institution. These are self imposed goals, and hopefully, they, they, they would act as an encouragement to other banks and institutions, including local banks and institutions in South Asia to come up with similar goals. So what the key, some of the key highlights are that IFC wants to invest 35% of all its financing directly towards climate mitigation. So for every dollar that we finance, we want 35% of that to go to climate. The second, starting July 2023, we want 85% of our financing to be Paris aligned. And right now we are developing the entire methodology uh, to basically tell our team what does it mean to be Paris aligned and how do we make sure that 85% is Paris aligned. And by 2025, starting 2025 onwards, we want 100% of our financing to be Paris aligned. So these are very ambitious goals, but from these goals will flow our strategy of financing in many different sectors. Some of the key sectors that we have identified and we have many industry teams working in them are obviously the energy sector, then the agriculture, water, food, and land mixes. That's the second bucket. The third is the cities, which would include municipalities, urbanization, green buildings, waste, water, all of that. Uh, fourth would be transportation. Where a number of speakers earlier have talked about, including Manish has talked about the mobility, storage, transportation, energy efficiency, all of that. And finally, manufacturing. And in manufacturing, we again put it into two buckets. One is the large industries. How do we make sure that they transition to a decarbonized uh, pathway? And the second is the MSMEs, which is much more complicated. These are part of value chains of manufacturing company. How do you provide products and instruments and advice to make sure that they integrate climate and energy efficiency in what they do? And the challenges there are humongous, including access to finance and so on. So as we speak, IFC has not only investment expertise, but we have we are now developing a lot of teams working on the advisory side and upstream side to work in the entire ecosystem so that climate finance is really mainstream. And for that, we would need a lot of partnership. It's a scale problem. IFC or a single VFI, no single VFI, would be able to achieve uh, the 2030 objectives. So a lot of partnerships are needed, and, and that's what IFC is uh, committed to. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shalab. I think this is uh, very interesting, the climate change action goals. I'm sure that will also create the cascading effect to attract more private sector capital to the sector. So if 35% of IFC's balance sheet, then that's really a huge um, you know, capital that will flow in. And yes, you rightly said that renewable energy has become more conventional in that sense. And I would dare draw in Ahmed here. Uh, so, Emma, uh, the substantial benefits of renewable energy are becoming increasingly obvious to the world. With costs of renewable energy rapidly falling and a number of countries that are taking, uh, looking at scaling up, I mean, look at India uh, for, that, for that matter, I think it is emerging as worthy means to achieving climate resilience. Uh, what type of policy interventions do you think then are needed for BFIs, financial institutions, private capital to come in to further accelerate the scale that, you know, uh, also Shalab mentioned, we have a scale problem. So the scale in RE capacities to strengthen climate resilience in particularly emerging markets. Thank you, Namita, for giving me the opportunity to, to join such a prestigious gathering, number one. Number two, actually, your point actually is, or the question is multidimensional. So, in, in from the ultimate uh, or overarching uh, perspective, it's all about how can we, at the policies should be working about attracting more private sector investors to come in. Since, as you, as, as you rightly mentioned, that the prices are falling and uh, there is a need to scale up. And as per our uh, last, world, last World Energy Transition Outlook report, or what we call it, WITO report, there is a need to scale up by five times the investment global uh, 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 of, of installed capacity by five times, meaning that we go, we need to go five times than what we had in the last 2019, just before pandemic. In that perspective, I have to say that it's all about de-risking 
or ensuring more de-risking policies and financial products that will be centered around how we de-risk more business climate to have private sectors to come in. But de-risking here is very wide and broad meaning, meaning the following, that if you look for what is needed in terms of, uh, if you go for specifically Sub-Saharan Africa, it will be totally different than what would be needed in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, for example, in terms of ind industrialism and needs for renewable energy have different business model and different uh, demographics than what's needed in Sub-Saharan Africa. Just to give a comparator between two regions, Sub-Saharan Africa needs to go more towards crowding in local banks and to go for a small scale and even micro scale projects to add, ensure access to several adaptive or ad adaptation and uh, uh, mitigation projects. But if you go more for uh, Southeast Asia, you need to go for small and medium projects, but all around, not only adaptation and mitigation, but more importantly, is on the industrial side. And that's really gives different type of set of skill mix. And in that sense, basically, uh, it's not only uh, crowding in local banks, that's which, which is a key, but sometimes you need to go for a specific set of policies. Like for example, if you go here for uh, for project to uh, around agribusiness, because I noticed that you were talking about agribusiness and more adaptation approach of pro climate action projects in terms of renewable energy. We can see clearly that, for example, just to give some names, uh, 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 solar-based accurate irrigation projects is very much needed, given the pandemic and the need to work along expanding the water energy food nexus. That's not the, totally the case if you go for Sub-Saharan Africa, specifically north of Sub-Saharan Africa, where water is not a problem. The problem is access to energy. And here, the flexibility of renewable energy in Amica is very important. One of the very important features for renewable energy is that we need to work these de-risking policies around is to basically give the feature of having the flexibility of decentralized renewable energy solutions. That's not the case of normal fossil fuel energy access solution. The second issue, if we're talking about this in terms of set of policies, is that how can we make sure that local banks have the capacity and the ability to build their de-risking matrix, not only around the part, uh, the part of the ESG, as our uh, earlier colleague from uh, Tata Foundation talked about, which is very important, but more importantly, how we ensure that all elements around de-risking are there. It's about financial de-risking, environmental de-risking, whether the risking what all, all around this it's set of risking, but has to some has to be bold, some has to be taken back. It, it's different from one region to another. Finally, I have to say that also there is a need for also to scale up uh, uh, de risking mechanisms for larger scale projects because if you go for other regions, like for example, MENDA region or Latin America region, you will find easily that small, large scale project is the model to be filled in by these governments and hence. To attract foreign direct investors, we need to make sure that the responses, for example, for if I'm given as, as one example about uh, 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 onshore wind, the most important barriers that takes time in order for any investment to grow up is about where the migration. But from the solar side, I'm just giving an example. I can get, I can give get several, but just to, to because of the limit of time, I can say for solar for water access and water energy mixes, specifically the solar water desalination is a key here. Plus, uh, hazardous waste management, that's really another key important issue. And more importantly, above all that, across all these type of de-risking policies that foreign direct investors are looking at, is basically what I, what, I, what we call it in IRENA as we are promoting this kind of approach, is sustainable management of de-risking systems. Because most of the foreign direct investors, we hear from them clearly over the past two years that their main problem is about geopolitical risk. What if they invest, and after after two years down the road of putting their investment and they put the money, okay, basically their cost of capital, since you talk about cost of capital, is getting very high to ensure there is very good insurance about determination risk and default risk. Unless there is a very well secured, sustained de-risking uh, 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 management system, so that insurance companies will, show, will make sure that their uh, premium will be going low because the risk will be very low, it makes then very costly and this takes from financial return of return. Uh, I know that I give some kinds of heads up from the above, but I think for subsequent questions, we can detail that down. Uh, thank you, Nimito, over to you. Thank you, thank you. I think uh, you've made a very relevant point in terms of 
de-risking policies and financial products. And uh, I agree with you that you know one size cannot fit all. So the localized approach uh, is very very important, and that to a kind of a de-risking matrix which has, which is more holistic to cover all aspects. And uh, there I would move on to Rustico. Uh, Rustico, uh, the Development Bank of Philippines has done a lot of work within the country. MSMEs are a key player in climate action interventions, uh, given that they are very vulnerable to climate risks, but also uh, have the capacity to build community level climate resilience. And, um, uh, you know, the DBP has been offering various forms of financing to the MSMEs in the country, covering a range of sectors like agroforestry, sustainable agribusinesses, energy efficiency, and sanitation, among others. So how has its experience been so far? And what, in your view, are some of the specific solutions that uh, you have undertaken, which has been able to create that impact where you've uh, supported MSMEs in building climate resilience? Uh, thank you, Namita. Uh, I was muted a while ago. And good day to everyone. Um, well, regarding your, thank you for the question. No? In my view, uh, given the negative effects of COVID-19 pandemic uh, in the businesses and the different businesses, so there are changes no, that we have to factor in in the, in the different businesses. And the DFIs, no, or the Development Financial Institutions, should assess or revisit the whole value chain of targeted sector or industry to determine the vulnerabilities and sustainable approaches with an end in view of creating a reliable uh, supply chain and market linkage. So uh, we really have to rethink the, the business model right now because uh, the, the approach right now since the lockdowns and the different uh, uh, business uh, affected. No? So the whole value chain will have to be revisited and uh, you know look into so that we'll be able to uh, have a good... Uh, uh, solutions to, to provide. And there, uh, the development financial institution can develop and promote innovative financing programs for climate change adaptation and mitigation projects that would have value to MSMEs. An example is an, on energy efficiency project. The development financial institutions uh, could offer loan based on energy savings. We all know that good energy efficiency project <clears throat> as a payback period of three to five years. Hence, it can attract MSMEs to invest to improve electricity cost and operational efficiency. Finally, uh, the development financial institutions can also encourage the micro, small, and medium enterprises to use digital platform to reduce dependence on physical services resources, expand market reach and flexibility, and increase efficiency. So that's all, Namita, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, determining vulnerabilities and rethinking business models, I think that's the mantra going forward. And that's where I want to rope in Jigar. Uh, Jigar, one of the biggest challenges in sustainable finance is the lack of common understanding. I mean, if businesses have to rethink, then understanding of what is green, what is sustainable is very, very critical. And this, uh, you know, gets even more complicated with interventions that are centered around climate resilience. So what steps need to be taken uh, to ensure better financial decision making by investors in order to mobilize private capital for climate resilience? Over to you, Jigar. Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening to everyone. And uh, thank you, Optus, for inviting me to this panel uh, discussion. Uh, so very rightly, uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, the harmonization of the sustainable standards and framework is not there, uh, just like the financial reporting. Uh, I believe it would take a few years before all the different uh, sustainability standards that exist uh, would collaborate with the likes of IFRS and you would probably see a more uh, harmonized uh, data, which we all can evaluate as simply uh, and without any confusion, uh, like we do for the uh, financial reporting. Uh, coming to uh, resilience, uh, what I want to uh, say is that it, it is an understated uh, 
area. Generally, the discussion revolves around uh, transition risk uh, and not so much about physical risk. So, so as an investor, uh, when I look for data, uh, I find a lot of data relating to uh, transition risk of different sectors and companies, uh, their own targets, uh, their pathways, and so on and so forth, and, and the pledges that they take. But on physical uh, risk, the data is limited, and uh, it also needs to be a lot more specific to different geographies. Uh, investors would also like to get uh, information on uh, supply chains in specific geographies or value chains and how they get impacted uh, due to the different uh, events of a, a flood or water stress or uh, uh, you know storms or hurricanes, heat waves. And uh, on some of these, uh, uh, you know, for example, in one of the previous presentation, uh, the heat wave or cold wave was not even mentioned. So you can see that what is the paucity of data at that level. So I feel that uh, you know TCFT reporting, uh, whether at a very uh, initial level, also should be encouraged and adopted uh, as much as possible, so that uh, there is a greater data available, and uh, there can be uh, more scenario analysis and stress testing that becomes possible. It would be very very beneficial for banks and insurance companies uh, to nudge for that. Uh, that benefits everybody, and. Uh, uh, I think it will also uh, attract a lot of impact investors as uh, I think the uh, Tata Clean Tech presentation uh, uh, revealed that it, essentially the long-term funding gap remains and that will only come from impact investors who are not always extremely uh, oriented towards financial returns. So as long as there is some impact, uh, there will also be uh, uh, you know, capital available for that, but that impact uh, data should be available. So essentially, I would say to conclude that, you know, what gets reported gets measured. Uh, so investors would want uh, that, I think, uh, and I want to highlight the area of physical risk over here. Thank you. Thank you, Jigar. I think aggregation of data and use of technology kicks in here. And, you know, we've seen how artificial uh, intelligence is being used I think it needs to be applied in this uh, this sector. And as far as I fully agree with you, as far as you know, um, skill upgradation of uh, you know within financial institutions is very critical on ESG climate risk analysis. And Octus ESG is working in India with banks uh, and investors to um, to you know under under a large developed market government uh, program. Uh, where we're working on greening of financial systems and training uh, banking officials. So I fully agree that this is so much um, important. I would like to draw uh, Shalab here. And uh, uh, Shalab, uh, my question to you is that, uh, you know, one of the earlier presentations, we saw how alternative financing instruments such as catastrophe bonds or climate resilience bonds are emerging as uh, worthwhile solutions to mobilizing uh, capital for climate projects. Additionally, there is also an enabling ecosystem that is building, uh, and this is to support such issuances, you know. So, for example, the Climate Bonds Initiative released the Climate Resilience Principles, and EBRD also launched the first ever dedicated climate resilience bond, uh, raising over 700 uh, million USD. So, what, in your view, in these markets need to be done to create the policy enablement or environment to support uh, you know, similar issuances or more uptake of such issuances in emerging markets? No, thanks. Thanks, Namita. As you may very well know, since you were also in Yes Bank, IFC was one of the early investors in the green bond that Yes Bank issued several years ago. Since then, we have uh, subscribed to a few green bonds from India and in East Asia. Uh, more recently was the Continuum Green Bond, which is an offshore green bond by an existing renewable energy player. And then a few of our clients in India, like Hero Futures, Azure, have issued these offshore green bonds. In, uh, in East Asia, we have issued actually blue bonds for recycling and so on, we have global blue bond, and those haven't even started in India. Today, I think in India, green bonds constitute less than 1% of the total bond issuances. Jigger has touched upon some of the issues like data and 
from the information asymmetry, uh, not having enough around physical risk that has been impeding it. But if I look at how do you break the log jam and how do you make sure that all these alternative pieces of finance, let's start with green bond, which is probably the lowest hanging fruit, gets going in a big manner. So at least from an IFC perspective, uh, we see it as the banks should be leading uh, in this area in a big manner. Uh, why some of the green bonds are not being domestic uh, anchored is because there's there's a size issue, there's a scale issue. A lot of the international investors want to subscribe to very large issuances. And such large issuances can only happen if you have a very large portfolio. And some of these RE, very few RE companies, therefore, can tap these large investors. The, uh, and why is there not enough scale is in there? Because you're not able to attract these large investors. There are not enough large issuances. So it's a chicken and egg situation. And one way to break the log jam is to have banks in the whole game in the whole lock jam and banks start issuing green bank bonds. And that creates a ripple effect. They have to use the green bonds and deploying it in more green finance projects. That creates the ecosystem, both push and pull, and creates and develops the entire market, including development of stock exchanges, the domestic INX exchange, and so on. And that will deepen the capital market. IFC and the World Bank are putting a lot of resources, particularly in India and Bangladesh, to deepen these capital markets. We are part of task forces with the RBI, with the BBA, and giving our inputs based on client feedbacks uh, to develop and deepen it. I think the other is uh, the other area which has been probably well documented even by RBI and they've acknowledged there is a need for a comprehensive green policy to cover around knowledge and awareness, around definitions, around disclosure, uh, around uh, capital resilience risk, all of that. And But more importantly, as I mentioned, the World Bank Group President has announced certain targets for ourselves. There is no better thing to, than to actually mandate, and we can even start, start small, mandate a certain percentage goes into green financing. And that starts the ball rolling. We've been talking about for it for a long time. There are pros and cons, but maybe we should start with some mandate which will set the ball rolling. These are, by the way, my personal views. Don't take it as institutional views around this topic. Thanks. Thanks. I think this is a this is a very important point. The way we say, for example, in India, we have the priority sector lending, uh, which is a clear mandate of uh, uh, you know focused sector lending. So I think that's uh, that could be uh, one of the one of the things that uh, the the RBI could pick up from uh, either. So there is a renewable energy carve out within the PSL, but that's not enough. So a green financing uh, you know mandate would be really uh, interesting. And uh, I would uh, like to get uh, Ahmed's views here. Uh, you know, Ahmad, reliable electricity access is crucial to build resilience in developing countries, especially during disasters. Uh, increasingly, uh, the renewable energy uh, is finding a foothold in emerging markets uh, with decentralized renewable energy uh, installations. And you and others uh, did uh, did uh, you know make a uh, make a reference to that. Now, uh, my uh, question to you is. Uh, uh, you know, these kind of decentralized uh, renewable energy projects uh, can also support community level resilience building and can improve access to um, other essential services like healthcare, water, uh, sanitation. And uh, at the same time, more and more proactive investments in resilience, especially in building local resilience, are gaining, I mean, are, are required. And we spoke about decentralized, um, uh, you know, decentralized uh, financing. So how do you think local renewable energy projects can be leveraged to build momentum in emerging markets? And since the focus is here, emerging markets, and how do you think DFIs can particularly go supporting this, given the kind of risks that these local activities, um, you know, the undertakers risk uh, that is there? So how do you think uh, we could resolve this? Over to you, Ahmed. Thank you, Nimita, very much. Again, this is a very multi-dimensional uh, question. And to be honest, uh, it's all depending again to the demographics of each community. But if you're talking about local communities, uh, I have to say that uh, DFIs, uh, we have to split them into two things, national DFIs and international development financial institutions or MDBs. In general, there is one example. I have seven or six examples, but I, I can say that uh, looking for attracting or uh, uh, getting uh, uh, 
constitutional funding, or I would say even, uh, let's put it as competitive uh, funding from MDBs for own lending to local development banks or local financial institution, that's really a very good solution. Look at the example of EPRD, or what we call it Green Economy Financing Facility, or GIFs, that used to be in the past SIFs, standing for Sustainable Energy Finance Mechanism. And if you look for one of the most hardest region to invest, which is MENA region, you can find the invested more than $2 billion. I'm not talking here about uh, LDCs or HEBIC or heavily poor in these countries, no. And if you look even for Southeast Europe, like the, 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 the ex yugoslavian countries, the, the, I mean the Balkan countries, they also invested more than $5 billion because actually the, the difference or the level playing field between a uh, cost of capital coming from MDBs to, LD, to local financial institution could make a good leverage mm -hmm. and attraction to local financial institution who have a lot of reserve to scale up decentralized renewable energy solution. And here the application is a lot. Solar rooftop, uh, district cooling, district heating, school heating, school cooling, it's all depending about the environmental and demographic condition that application are there. And there is a lot of examples here. But let's talk about numbers and how can the cost of capital will be more attractive. Because look, people from local communities, they know their risks very well. So all what they need is two things. How can they access more competitive funding? I wouldn't say constitutional funding, no competitive funding, meaning still commercial, but with a reasonable financial rate of return, plus capacity building. On our Syrian arena through this climate investment platform that we are leading, as you just mentioned earlier, Namita, we are playing this role. But this has to be in dual tandem, in parallel action with MDBs, and this is what we are trying to do with the other financing facilities that we are going to launch pretty soon. That's exactly the case, because if you look at the numbers we received from Climate Investment Platform, and for the WITO report that I referred to, 40% of the needed investments that under demand now to be done coming from small-scale decentralized renewable energy projects. So there is a huge business opportunity. There is a big gap need to be covered by MDBs and local development financial institutions to work together because access to cost of capital, specific and hard currency, is already there. All what is needed. The second important uh, uh, challenge for this local development institution is the availability of bankable projects or what we call it investor-ready projects. And this is what we're trying to do also on our side, plus for sure the de-risking mechanisms that we talked about earlier. I stop here to, to give the floor to you, Anita, for the subsequent uh, uh, very interesting discussion. I thank you for that over to you. No, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, the correlation that you brought out from, you know, the MDBs and the national institutions, I think that is very important. And how do you access uh, competitive commercial uh, finance? I think that is a very, very important point. And that reminds me and Shalab will... Uh, as agree with me that uh, this was when Yes Bank did the second green bond that it issued with IFC, where IFC did a rupee denominated bond on the London Stock Exchange, leveraged its uh, uh, you know bay network to get marquee investors and then privately placed that into a uh, you know domestic issuer. I think that was a very interesting innovative model. So we need to bring in quite a lot of innovations, and you did mention about uh, you know the challenges that are there, and I want to go to Ristico here where, you know, the challenges, um, uh, you know, are there. And given that it is often difficult to justify the high upfront cost of projects that have longer term ben benefits, we heard other speakers also touch upon that uh, in comparison to the interventions or the easy conventional sector financing, which is much easy, easy and that has immediate benefits, right? So even when climate finance does experience inflows, uh, the focus is disproportionately towards the climate mitigation, renewable energy and uh, products like this. Uh, but we've not seen so much of capital flowing towards climate adaptation or resilience. I mean, blue bonds, uh, IFC has issued, but I would like to see more of, you know, um, financing going to blue. So what type of alternative financing instruments do you think can be innovated by DFIs to increase the outlay uh, towards climate resilience projects? Uh, so what, what, what is it that you are doing or what are you your thoughts, I would like to, we would like to hear that. Over to you, Rasiko. You're muted. 
Oh, thank you, Namita. Uh, I'd like to share on the part of the Development Bank of the Philippines on how we're doing things. No, So one instrument that we're looking at is the Sustainability Bond, where DBP issued it in November of 2019, where, where we raised uh, around 362.5 million US dollars at uh, fixed rate DBP ASEAN Sustainability Bonds. The proceeds raised uh, were used to finance or refinance new and existing green or social assets that are related to banks' uh, various sustainability programs. So the projects that we funded are renewable energy, water supply and sanitation, and hospitals. Another instrument is the Green Climate Fund. Uh, this was mentioned a while ago by uh, Mr. Olympus Mantata of the Development Bank of South Africa. And uh, as you may have known, DBP's accreditation as a direct access entity was approved by the GCF Board of Directors last July 2021. So the Green Climate Fund uh, aims to support low carbon and climate resilient initiatives in developing countries, which may be tapped as a concessional loan, grant, equity, or guarantee, which I think will be able to address uh, and be able to increase outlay to climate resilient projects. And lastly, uh, if I may also share the experience of DBP in terms of one of the projects, no? we could also explore co-financing of funds or blending of funds to increase investment in climate resilience, resilience projects. An example of the co-financing uh, program that DBP had in the past is the Philippine Water Revolving Fund. So PWRF, uh, maybe a lot of the uh, ADPF members here uh, knows this, no? uh, is a lending facility uh, designed to provide innovative financing solutions to water supply and sanitation projects, whose ultimate goal is to increase Filipinos' access to uh, clean water and sanitation services. So there are four financing modalities implemented under PWRF to encourage public-private partnership. One is uh, DBP and public-private uh, financial institution co-financing scheme. This is where DBP as a government financing institution shares the loan with private financing institutions. Uh, this would uh, in, in increase their confidence in lending to water supply and sanitation projects. At the same time, uh, well, the greater part of, if, I think the ratio here is 55-45, 55, 45, 55 being uh, uh, funded by uh, private uh, financial institutions. So another uh, modality is uh, PWRF lending to PFI. This is where we do wholesale lending to PFI. So the PWRF fund is channeled uh, through uh, the uh, private financial institution. The third modality is the full PFI or the private financial institution um, financing with standby loan agreement. So how does it work? No, uh, Usually or typically private financial institution will just be comfortable extending say 7 to 10 year loan. However, this is a mismatch if you talk about water supply and sanitation because there are restrictions in terms of the affordability of the uh, end users and therefore they would need long-term financing of up to 20 years. So to bridge the gap, uh, we provided the standby loan agreement. So we're in uh, the standby loan to, uh, to private financing institution provides loan takeout mechanism after seven to or 10 years should the private financial institution opt to exit. So that's how it works. Uh, that's the third modality. And the last uh, one is the private sector participation by a direct equity in a private corporation. So this is where we fund no? uh, the, let's say, the concessionaire, private concessionaires wanting to invest into water supply and sanitation projects. So thank you and back to you, Namit. Thank you. I think this is uh, this is very informative and, uh, you know, combining debt and equity into a fund uh, at times uh, can be challenging, but you've done it uh, through the PWRF. And I think uh, that's that's really a very good example that you've uh, cited here of co-financing and, you know, collaborative approach. Uh, you know, my point on climate resilience is that at the core, uh, there uh, sits uh, the community and there sits the uh, you know, issues related to humanity 
and um, you know climate resilience is very deeply connected connected to just transition uh, given that building adaptive capacities is very critical to ensuring that the world um, you know especially the world in the emerging markets don't experience a disorderly transition to net zero so while we are hearing a lot of net zero i think uh, uh, you know um, bringing communities to the core of that decision making becomes very difficult or uh, needs to be needs to be, has become critical so i want to bring in jigar here and uh, jigar i was very enthused by uh, maybank kim's uh, kimings uh, a uh, vision of humanizing financial services and how that is embedded towards this journey of climate action so uh, would you would you like to share some of your thoughts on this please yeah uh, thanks uh, on uh, uh, just transition just uh, i i will say a few things in general uh, my view is that uh, unless the developed markets help the emerging markets in terms of uh, finance and technology uh, which were agreed upon in the paris agreement but they are not really moving yet to to the extent that they should uh, otherwise uh, i think for emerging countries to expedite on the uh, net zero uh, etc would be very difficult uh, and also to impose any kind of uh, sharp carbon taxes also would be very difficult so uh, having said that uh, you know i i feel that this is uh, something which uh, we will probably know more after the cop 26 meeting and if i hope it moves into that uh, positive momentum as far as uh, uh, you know maybank is concerned i speak for maybank investment bank uh, which i represent and uh, you know our uh, humanizing financial services Uh, is uh, you know well described by the uh, vision that we have submitted in our 2025 forward position statement which was done some time ago uh, so uh, we do a few things one uh, you know everybody uh, thinks uh, for sustainability first uh, you know in every activity that you do in every uh, strategy transaction uh, line of business that you work you think first about sustainability secondly you engage with the client uh, you engage with the client in terms of uh, providing them a solution uh, in terms of uh, explaining them the benefits of uh, reducing the cost of capital for uh, taking up low co- low carbon transition uh, and uh, we look for uh, equitable uh, growth opportunities Uh, for uh, all the stakeholders concerned uh, so these are some of the uh, you know critical things that we do over and above that we also uh, look at uh, upskilling the people uh, and uh, people take up a specific amount of uh, time and effort to educate themselves more on sustainability so that they can provide the proper engagement and innovative solutions to the clients so this is uh, our effort towards humanizing the uh, financial services thank you sustainability first i think that's uh, that's the way forward thank you and we have 9 uh, minutes left so i want to go to each one of you for very quick thoughts on the last round of questions uh, so shall up to you what insights do you have to share on the scalability of uh, you know partnership impactful partnership models that ifc has been using Yeah, as i mentioned uh, namita in my opening partnerships holds the key to solving the climate problem uh, we have established several partnerships directly on the financing side we have a very large e loan program and parallel financing mobilization program and also our own asset management companies to mobilize equity that's a direct financing partnership then on the knowledge side we have had successful partnerships like the carbon pricing leadership coalition which we are well aware of a sustainable housing leadership coalition where the purpose is to impart knowledge learn from each other and and further the climate agenda through either pricing or green building uh, codes or technical assistance whatever it is and also bringing newer technologies from global emerging markets to uh, to other emerging markets and the third is the larger ecosystem which i call the formal and informal networks that i see or the world bank is part of because we have such a large portfolio in these emerging markets 
not only are these clients part of our network, but the suppliers to those clients, the technology providers to those clients, the regulators, the policy makers, other investors, they are all part of this larger ecosystem. And by virtue of that, I think IC is uniquely positioned to exercise its convening power to forge together an alliance, if it makes sense, and to build on a partnership. And we are very open to ideas. If you have ideas, please share with us, please discuss, and we're happy to participate and contribute in any manner. Thanks. Great, great. Forging partnerships is the way to go. So, Amit, my question to you is on the back of the, uh, you know, climate impact report that Irina had recently done and the fact that we have over 300 participants here on this uh, on this webinar across geographies, what opportunities would you like to highlight, uh, especially, you know, the solutions around climate resilience in order to uh, develop renewable-based resilience interventions uh, for these markets that are there? Uh, I, would I would say that the most relevant opportunities here is that I'm inviting all participants around the, 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 the this important uh, webinar is to, to come and join the climate investment platform, which is capitalizing on our competitive advantage in IRENA, which is unique globally, that we are in partnership with all our more than 100, we are reaching 170 member countries in which we are working with them to establish robust NDCs that come up with very specific and robust politically well uh, projects uh, to be invested in. And second, and more importantly, is that within our platform, we are working on sustainable management of de-risked projects, transactional based. With these two, this is a pragmatic way to partner with banks, and we have more than 55 banks in this platform, in order to scale up investment at all levels, whether mega, large, medium, small, micro, all levels. I would like to, 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 to give this opportunity, which is very wide platform, but is existing and already delivered results. And would like to, to use this uh, important webinar to invite all of them to come and join. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's I think that's a very big opportunity. And I'm sure there are many from the audience who will leverage that. Rustico, my question to you is that uh, DBP has been one of the oldest or maybe the first banks in Philippines to integrate environmental considerations. The ESG that is being so much talked about by investors, by bankers uh, today. Uh, tell me very quickly, if you could tell us what DFIs need to do to strengthen this within their you know, lending strategies and uh, the commitments that they make. So some quick messages for um, for the DFIs who are present here, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Namita. For the Philippines, no, our regulator or the Banco Central ng Pilipinas already issued the Sustainable Finance Framework, which requires the integration of sustainability principles encompassing environmental and social risk areas in the corporate governance and risk management, as well as in the strategic objectives and operations of the bank. Perhaps the development financial institution should also develop their own sustainable finance framework where it can align the environment, uh, social, and governance considerations. Part of the framework should uh, include the development of the environmental and social risk management system to help strengthen <clears throat> the DFI's climate resilience lending. So in the case of the Philippines, the financial institution are given three years transition period for the sustainable finance framework. So it takes time to adopt uh, the framework. So the framework should be established to provide the guide for the actions to, and uh, last and most important uh, is obtaining the support of your board and management because there are difficult decisions to be made. Thank you. Great. Thank you. No, I think those are very relevant points. Thanks a lot. And uh, Jigar, to you with your final comments, uh, you know, the market analysis shows that Climate is a big opportunity for financial institutions. However, there is a huge supply-demand gap. What, in your opinion, should financial institutions do to make a business case and capitalize on this opportunity? Very briefly, if you could highlight your points. Yeah, in, in my view, if uh, there is one thing that needs to be done is, uh, uh, you, you know, financial institutions and banks themselves need to start report, reporting on a PCFD basis, which is not uh, mandatory at the moment. 
at least in Asia, I, I don't think even elsewhere it is mandatory, but on a voluntary basis, that would bring out a lot of details of customer related emissions. And uh, that would also uh, nudge the customers to uh, develop more transparency in terms of reporting. So overall, I think that can help, uh, you know, scale up the whole system, uh, which is the, not the case today. Uh, so that, that would be my uh, major uh, suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, TCFD, UK government has made it uh, mandatory uh, from 2022 filings for TCFD to become mandatory and there will be a cascading effect of investors asking for the data across markets. So we are not far away from uh, this becoming more formal reporting. Um, I mean, the non-financial reporting becoming a kind of a mandate. But I think this was a very interesting uh, uh, discussion. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Shalab Ahmad Ristiko Jigar. Uh, truly appreciate your uh, being here and being very candid with your insights, uh, which have been extremely valuable. And uh, I've taken copious notes. I think this is very useful. I'm sure uh, it has been also very interesting and useful for other audiences who are present here. And, um, uh, you know, we would we would continue to engage with you. And, uh, you know, this is a uh, this is a very important topic where all of us are in this uh, uh, in this movement towards 2030 and beyond, I would think. Uh, so uh, so let's uh, let's be connected. And thanks a lot. And I'm certain that this webinar has taught us all a lot and will surely help uh, in taking the overall global climate resilience efforts uh, forward. So thanks a lot for joining in and thank you very much. And over to you, Sanika, uh, for your final closing. Thank you. Thank you, Namada. Uh, we are well approaching the end of the webinar and thank you so much to all the participants, the speakers, the panelists who have stayed with us. The conversations have been riveting, a lot of food for thought, I believe. Uh, with this, I would like to thank our partners, AdFim and AdFia. Thank you to the Climate Group and the platform of the United Nations Climate Week New York. I have one interesting announcement before we close. Uh, Octa CSG in partnership with 2030 WRG World Bank, uh, under the aegis of Old for Climate, a government of Italy 3COP initiative, is organizing a webinar on scaling up freshwater restoration by using local or indigenous knowledge and practices. This webinar is scheduled for 1st October Friday, uh, and the link to register for the webinar is in the chat box below. So please do join us. Uh, to take the discussion on climate finance forward, you may contact the email ID given on the screen or visit our website. Thank you very much and have a great day.